get started. Thank you all for coming. This is our third and final series with Rizzoli this summer, and I'm happy to see everyone. I'm sad I missed last week Dino Bori from Italy. I was out of town. Uh, but today we're pleased to welcome Jeanette Sadek Khan, the author of Street Fight and the former commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation from 2007 to 2013. In that role, she led, as many of you probably know, one of the most sweeping revitalizations of the city streets in a half century, adding nearly 400 miles of bike lanes, the first parking protected bike paths in North America. She also set in motion the creation of more than 60 pedestrian plazas around the city, including notably Times Square, but also the more than 35,000 square feet of public space that was created right here in our neighborhood, now collectively called the Flatiron Plazas at the iconic intersection of Broadway, 23rd Street, and Fifth Avenue. Our plazas were among the first to be created in the citywide program and are widely considered a model for other plazas, so we're very proud of that. Uh, Jeanette also worked with the MTA to launch the city's first seven rapid bus lines and oversaw hundreds of intersection and street redesigns that contributed to the city's overall record low traffic rate. Well, it is great to be here uh, with everyone, especially to be here with Jennifer and her team, uh, because mm -hmm. what happened in the Flatiron District is really a model um, for other places around the world. And I have to say, you know, when I go and give these talks, and I've been with my colleague Seth Salmana, who's my press secretary at New York City DOT, and so he really not only was my co author on this book, but really understood and defended us during um, some of the toughest times. Uh, when we show the picture of Flatiron, you hear this audible <gasps> from the crowd, and I think it speaks volumes um, about the transformational effect that Jenna and her team had um, on the streets of New York City. So. Um, before I get started, I wanted to uh, recognize the 4,500 men and women of the New York City Department of Transportation because they were the ones that actually not only took care of our infrastructure every day, but they were the ones that implemented the transformative changes that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And one of the heroes uh, is actually here today, Seth, who I mentioned, and uh, yeah, we should definitely give a round of applause to Seth. Um, because uh, you don't get through the kinds of battles that we fought without having a really strong um, fight at your side. And for all of us here at City DOT, what do you all think about, about when you think about the street? This is actually a question. <laughs> <laughs> Traffic? Mm -hmm. yes. Asphalt? Construction. Construction, yes, construction certainly these days. Mm -hmm. Crowds. Crowds? Noise. Noise? Impact on businesses? This is somebody from the business improvement <laughs> district. Um, well, most people, when they think about a street, they think about something like this, very much along the lines of what you just mentioned. Um, and streets are what make cities great and what makes cities not so great. And for decades, leaders have looked at streets like this and said, yep, everything was working just fine. But it wasn't always this way. You know, our streets used to be more like living rooms. This is actually Mott Street, and you can see, you know, lots of different ways to get around, not only walking, but you've got horse carriages there, um, lots of choices for getting around. And eventually those choices are whittled away. This is that same intersection a hundred years ago. And you know, where would you even walk on this street? And, and where would you even walk to? And it really reminds me of this video game I used to play <laughs> as a kid called Frogger. Frogger. Did any of you guys play Frogger? Right? I actually think this game should have been called Pedestrian. <laughs> and here's a real life translation. And, and there are all sorts of signs on our streets on how people have really fallen through the cracks. And looking at a street like this, you get the sense that people have actually given up hope. You know, they've actually forgotten that our streets could be different and they're tired of battling. And it was never actually a really fair fight. Because the national standards from our streets come from the federal government, and they tell us everything from the size of the font on our signs to the width of our streets. And it's kind of like the Ten Commandments, only like 500 pages long. And as you can see, the best clip art that money can buy. Of the guy, and you won't find a single person. And an emoji interpretation boils down to this. 
you start with a city, add some roads, you throw in some stoplights, you take out those pesky pedestrians, and voila, you've got fast cars and a lot of engineers celebrating get another job well done. Just don't try to cross that street on foot. But it doesn't have to be that way, and this is one of our signature uh, pictures, you know, right here. It is possible to reclaim, to redesign, to reimagine our streets. It just awaits those who care and those who dare. And our work in New York City stemmed from Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC Long Range Sustainability Plan. And that Plan YC was about how do we accommodate the million people that are expected to move here by 2030 and still improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods and in Seven our new district. rapid bus lines, the largest bike share system in North America, the safest streets in 100 years. But that's the short story. You know, the slightly longer story is that every day was a fight. And it was a fight to give people more choices for getting around. And we were fighting to change the culture of New York and to set it in a new direction. And we learned some lessons along the way. And the first lesson is that you can paint the city you want to see. You can accomplish a lot by just using the materials that you have on hand. And we wanted to show New Yorkers what was possible. This is Times Square in the 1950s. And this is it 60 years later in 2008. And not much has changed, you know, other than the fact that the cars no longer have tail fins. And if you were in business and you didn't change how you did business in 50 years, do you think you'd still be in business? Shortly after I started, probably. We created our first pedestrian plaza, actually in Brooklyn, on Pearl Street. And we did it with paint, with lanterns, and chairs, and we took this underutilized parking lot and we transformed it into a plaza. We transformed it from a place that people parked to a place that people wanted to be. And it didn't take millions of dollars and it didn't take decades to do. And we made these transformations all over town. You've seen what happened um, on 14th Street, um, right in front of uh, the new Apple store that moved in. And today it's actually hard to remember what that used to look like. And Madison Square, which was this, this we had one of our largest uh, intersections in New York City, this was 170 feet long, um, and it was impossible to cross. And it was this warrant of streets coming together, it was a tangle of traffic. And so we created 65,000 square feet of new public space um, in 2008, and people came out as soon as we combed off the street. Um, I don't know if people remember this, this was an art class that came out like two hours after we put out the orange barrels. It was incredible. It was like the Star Trek episode, you know, like people weren't there before and then suddenly whoosh, all these people came into the new um, laws. And you also know that most of Manhattan is on the grid, right? North, south, east, west. The only road that cuts through that grid is Broadway, you know, cuts a diagonal through it, did great things, created these, you know, plazas um, as, it, as it cut across those, created these new um, intersections, but also created these uh, tangle of traffic. And in Times Square at the time, before the interventions, we had 90% of the people, of the traffic, was people on foot. And yet they only had 10% of the space. And they constantly would trade the safety of the sidewalk for the street just to get by. Because we're all New Yorkers, and you know, there's nothing that drives us more crazy than being stuck behind tourists <laughs> that are like walking like three or four people abreast. You know, we start to kind of vibrate, you know, like, move, 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 you know, and then we jump into the street to get by, and then we get hit by cars, and that's not a good story. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a big problem, and especially when we had, well, we had 350,000 people doing this every day. So I brought this idea and to my So we uh, closed it, and it worked, and people came out. Uh, it was a total home run. You know, and again, one of the stories, and, and it takes the kind of innovation of business improvement district leaders like Jennifer Brown, is, over here, in case you don't know your bid director, raise your hand, Jen. Um, but another bid director that was up there, Tim Tompkins, uh, at the bid, we were closed off with the orange barrels, Times Square, and then we looked down, and was, there was a sea of asphalt. And we realized, oh my God, there's nothing there. We have to put something there. And so, you know, Tim and others came up with this brilliant idea 
that we were going to go to Pinching Hardware Store and we were going to buy beach chairs. And we did that. We bought hundreds and hundreds of beach chairs at $10.99 and we threw those beach chairs out. Uh, and the story of the day became the beach chairs. The next day, all of the reporters wrote about the beach chairs. They didn't write about the fact that we closed the Times Square to cars. They wrote about the beach chairs. Did you like the beach chairs, the color of the beach chairs, the feel of the beach chairs? So I like to tell people that are involved in controversial projects, just throw out some beach chairs and everyone else bring data. And so we brought lots and lots of data. And we called the project Green Light for Midtown because we wanted to make sure and we wanted to make clear that we were going to keep traffic moving, uh, but we were also developing new ways to measure what happened beyond just uh, traffic flow. We looked at the safety and mobility benefits and we found 80% fewer people walking. We found pedestrian injuries down 35%. We found motorist injuries down 63%. Traffic moved better and we proved that. And again, data-driven mayor, we normally, how you prove how traffic flows by the, what's called the floating car method. And so you have the cars drive through a project area before and you have cars drive through afterwards and that's how you measure it. And uh, the mayor turned to me and he was not comfortable with that method. He's like, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe you're going to have your people floor it, you know, as they go through on the after scenario. And so how do we know that this is going to be neutral? I don't. So we actually had um, the benefit of GPS devices uh, in all 13,000 yellow cabs. So we actually were able to measure what happened by examining 1.1 million taxi cab records from those GPS records. Mm -hmm. And that's how we proved the traffic the city to track what happened at the cash register and not just uh, curb to curb. And we found protected bike lanes saw retail increases of almost 50% um, along the corridors where we put them in. And we saw similar results with our plaza programs, with our bus programs. And this data is really important because it turns some of our biggest opponents into some of our biggest supporters. And we moved from streets that were governed by anecdotes, what do you like, what do you not like, what do you think, to streets that were governed by our strategic plan. And we started by collecting data uh, on 7,000 crashes. It was the largest traffic analysis ever done uh, in the United States at that time. And we looked at the who, the <coughs> what, the where, where, the when, the why of traffic crashes. And um, we used that data to inform all of our transportation investments. And it was a big success and led to the fact that we had the lowest traffic fatalities in New York City history. 